before we get started, I just wanted to throw this up here and maybe catch some vibes, catch some feels. How is this image related to the title of the talk, Security Design and Guidance at Scale? Or even so, as a security practitioner, can you probably relate to it? Yes, cybersecurity is a maze. And often as practitioners, we have to look deep, we have to look hard, flustered at times. So when it comes to security design and guidance and that too at scale, and you'll hear me say this a lot, when you're navigating this maze, there is a lot of precision, there's a lot of strategy and a ton of dash of creativity that you need when you're doing the work. So I'm Neelet DeMello, and um, I'm a security engineer at Datadog. The title of this talk, all fluff aside, let's cut to the chase. What does it take for security design and guidance at scale? Before I say any other word, a quick legal disclaimer, all the opinions, thoughts, anything that I say belongs to me, does not represent that of the organization, my company, anything else. A little bit about me. I am a security engineer at Datadog. I am a design nerd, so I really like to work closer to engineering, as close to inception, so hence I do security design and guidance. Previously, I've done platform and infrastructure engineering for the developer experience and developer platform at Intel. So a lot of software engineering background. My real foray into security was at McAfee, where I worked as a software engineer at the start on enterprise products, uh, if any of you might remember EPO, um, and then later on into McAfee mobile security, so the consumer side of products. So I kind of got like a sense of how business operates differently there. I got a lot of chops for education, so I've done a brief stint as a lecturer at Polytechnic College. So it kind of like has me thinking about how different people learn, different learning modalities and things like that. I'm really passionate about writing, one, because things are very chaotic, helps me think clearly, but also helps you to share your learnings really well. And um, I've been really blessed to have a lot of mentors in life, so I try to give back as much as I can. I'm a STEM mentor at San Jose State, really, I think grad school students are the ones who need mentoring the most, so I really enjoy doing that. That's my employer, Datadog, if you know them. We are a security and observability company uh, for any platform, any scale, mostly cloud native. So, a bird's eye view of what we are going to be covering today, um, I'm going to start again with a background on scale and security design. And then we're going to talk about the secure SDLC. I will deeply get into the trio of success for security design and guidance. And then the real deal here is the security design reviews. If you were at Chuck's talk earlier today about security champions, he briefly alluded to it a lot. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the decentralized approach that you need to take in order for this to work well. And finally, the most important piece here is developer experience. The bees that make the honey, they need to have the good experience. So, since the title of the talk contains the word scale, let's start by defining what scale means. It's, it's, it's very important to establish that common ground. Now, as a software engineer or anyone who deals with engineering, there are three main pillars for any data intensive system. There is reliability, there is scalability, and there is maintainability. So when we talk about scale, there, there are some nuances. Scale means what's the volume that your systems handle, how big your organization is, and how quickly it's growing. But there's also this other side of who your customers are and what kind of scale are they experiencing. So scale is that one thing that really starts to compound when it starts picking up momentum. And even more, when you're at a fast-paced, engineering-heavy organization, like Datadog, for example, there are very distinct traits of operating in that environment. And security in that environment needs to be a little bit different because what does a fast-paced engineering heavy organization look like? Well, for one, 
things get shipped fast and frequently. New services, prototypes, improvements, enhancements, they are being spawned at like light scale speed, for real. And then things are inherently cloud native. So the ratio of engineering and security engineering is pretty disproportionate. That's by design as well. So what you end up with is lean teams, lean security teams, infosec teams, privacy teams, risk teams, you name it, fairly lean. So what does security do at such places then, right? Well, for one, you have to take really calculated bets. And what governs those bets? Value, impact, and return on investment, right? So that being said, what's security design? I love The Simpsons, I had to throw one here. Security design and guidance, when it comes to that, let's look at the latest publication. I think everyone's probably like heard of it, the revisions that came to it, that, that CISA worked on. And the term secure by design encompasses both secure by design and secure by default. So really, everyone's now talking about it. But when it's design phase, you got to start thinking about security, right? And what does it mean? I just took the definition from the CISA publication itself because it's like the industry standard here. But it means that technology products are built in a way that reasonably protect against cyber actors successfully gaining access to your devices, your data, and your connected infrastructure. Really the whole shebang, right? It's not like you walk into a car dealership and you go like, hey, I want to get your latest model of the car, and then you get the car and they're like, I don't have seat belts on it. I need to now buy the seat belts. No, right? They come with it. So products need to be secure by design. And the most important thing in doing that is a security design review. When do you need to do a security design review? You need to do it at the start, but why? Because you need to proactively identify and address the vulnerabilities in your applications and services. And most importantly, not everything can be found through tools. And if you really want to have collaboration from the outset, this is the perfect ground for it. This is where you get deep, you understand what we are building, and then that's really a great way to get the collaboration going. And also, as you start doing more and more of these security design reviews across products, across features, across functions, at a business level, you start to understand where do my systemic risks lie and where do I need to focus more? Where can I be a little more comfortable? Where, can I, where do I need to really get strict about and dive deep? If you look at the secure development life cycle, regardless of the paradigm that you follow, really the phases here are the requirements, design, code, test, and release, right? How do you map it to the secure SDLC? far, far, far to the left at the requirements phase as an organization. This is something that we have been doing at Datadog. I've tried to get a very simplified view of it. But having your security requirements, having your assessment plan, or even your resource allocation for a security design review upfront. Then comes the design phase when your RFC is written, when your spec is being worked on, when your design doc is being worked on. And again, there's multiple people involved in it as stakeholders, your product managers, your engineering team leads, your ICs, so on and so forth. That's when a secure design and architecture review is done. Threat modeling is part of it. And not just that, you're making promises of having certain security considerations and that you're going to take into action. You need a test plan to make sure that that's really going to be fixed. So you also devise a test plan accordingly. Then comes the coding phase, implementation. That's when, as and where required, you do a secure code review. Finally, a secure testing, manual where required, a pen test or light touch assessment. And at the release phase, where it's like, you got to do an external pen test if required, an internal pen test if you have a pen test team, uh, your security monitoring and incident response. Do you have your right audit logs in place? Can you write some detections on top of it for high scale actions? So since you start from the foundation, it's, it's more incremental. You are almost like a sidecar at times, but things are making progress as and where required. 
And this is really not a new paradigm. You know, in 2021, when OWASP revised its top 10, the number four category that you see there is insecure design, right? And what that really means is it's a broad category, really, and it just means that there's a lack of risk profiling. You really do not know what's the criticality level of a service in terms of security. And that's why you are failing to put the security controls in place. And if you look at it in the broader context, what happens then is security best practices are not followed. And security bugs and vulnerabilities get introduced. Talking of tech debt, a poor design is the best recipe for an immense amount of tech debt. That also applies to security. And then starts like internal security events, breaches, and as a business, really what you care about, regardless of what you do, is business revenue, reputation, customer trust, and that's what goes, it's, it's the cycle of dumpster fires. And you may be sitting here and you're like, ah, oh, this is fine. <laughs> so the, in terms of the trio of success here, I, I, I did spend a lot of time creating a good foundation for security design and why it's important. Who all is talking about it? There are three elements. First is your, are your tools, right? Day in and day out, there's so many RFCs coming in or so many specs design documents coming in. You need a good intake process. You need a good intake process that can determine your service criticality. You need a good intake process that can determine what all are the inputs and then can probably create a base level threat model for you that then you can work on as a security engineer and the point of contact to then identify the novel threats. So your tool is important. Tools automate things for you. And then you layer on process, right? You layer on process to say when something should be done, how something should be done. And really, I think the most important factor there is people, you know, who is doing the work. So all three considered, these are your three trios. But as I've been working more and more in this space, I realized that just this is not sufficient. There's something else that's missing here. Constraints. As an organization, what are your unique constraints for your tools, your budgeting? Are your tools more tailored to the environment that you operate in? Your processes, maybe your organization is more top down, maybe your organization is more bottoms up, maybe your organization is more process hours, maybe your organization loves processes, constraints. People, maybe they don't have the right kind of training, maybe their motivations lie somewhere else. So. When you're looking at all of these three things, really, are you considering your constraints as well? And then comes the cost and the value proposition, right? You're asking me to do a lot of these things early on. I got to ship fast. What value am I getting? So think about it. As a developer, I get clear information on what's expected of me and how do I ver verify that behavior. As a product owner, what's the necessary action for a given risk? I understand that upfront. Maybe I need a pen test later on. Maybe I, am, I need to expect which vulnerabilities to fix. It's all decided early on. And then as a security engineer, really what do I care about? What's the overall risk posture for my services, my overall infrastructure? So then talking about the AppSec pipeline, there is your security design review that forms as a fundamental for your secure code reviews and then your dynamic testing, right? But there's one important rule at such organizations. Thou shall not block. Whatever you do, you cannot block me. Just cannot. But design adds value faster than it adds cost. So you need really good amount of processes in place for it. So let's talk a little bit about how we have been doing our security design review process. We have put in place clear guidance on when and how you should expect a security design review. And I'll point it out that levels will differ because scope of the review differs. The nature of the product or the feature differs, right? So if you're launching a new service, something that's really customer critical, your customer's been asking for a while, but that's probably gonna do some things architecturally that you are not very comfortable about. So at the launch of a new service, if you're majorly updating an existing service, yes, 
if there's a minor update, but that's, that service is security sensitive, probably authentication tokens or the way you authorize on certain things, where those connections are going, where it's written, things like that. And then also periodically going in and taking the grand scheme of things into consideration. What we have found out through doing so many security design reviews till date as a lean team is you need to really understand what are the type of reviews you get, understanding the level of efforts associated with it, and upfront creating those levels, level one for a consult, level two for a review or a code, re an RFC or a code review, level three for a full-fledged security assessment, and level four for if it's a partner engagement, one or two quarters of dedicated work for a security, pro for a set of products. And that brings us to the most important thing here is designing your intake that is really, really tailored to your organization. By that, what I mean is if a certain set of product resides with a cert certain way of monorepo, and that monorepo already has a certain way of CI, CD in place, your intake needs to consider that. You can't go and ask things that are out of context. That's just going to throw people off. But you are collecting as much information upfront. And as you can see here, you're asking information about what's the data store that you're using. Because you know what kind of authentication and authorization constraints are already in place for those data stores in your organization. You're asking about the internet exposure. Is it a publicly available one? Is it a private? Who can access it? Is it a customer? Is it someone internal? You're asking about untrusted inputs. What kind of untrusted inputs are you getting? And then what are service interfaces? Is this an API? Is this a gRPC interface? All that information that's required. Is there an authentication module that you're using for this? Are you proposing a different change to your author authentication module? Is there a need for a custom cryptographic usage? Or if so, maybe like a FIPS compliant module? Are you working with customer data? And if so, have you considered the classification levels and things like that? Also, what kind of APIs are in place? All of that, this is just a very generic view, but you are collecting the right amount of information upfront that helps you really prioritize your security reviews and also gives you more, more of the information you need. If you remember the three block diagrams that I showed you, that's pretty simplified. That's not how behind the scenes things work. Behind the scenes, here like this Swiss army that's like trying to plug in at different places. A security design review, you're not just doing a risk review, but at times you're doing a supply chain review. Okay, if there is something that's required, data related, privacy team may need to get involved. Your security operations might need to get involved. If you think this is important and you're writing some detections on top of it, are you writing the right kind of audit logs that are gonna help those detections as well? Um, based on that, what you get is like right amount of security and privacy requirements, a good threat model, right implementation guidance. Um, and then when you come to secure code review part, there are your tools, SAST and SCA. You have your manual code review where required. If it's like you're making some changes to an MFA module or so, you are going to need more dedicated ma manual code review. And then write security tests wherever required. So what that gives you is a security a group of findings and events that you can then fine tune on. And then dynamic testing. Certain times you may need to do pen tests, you may have a good bug bounty program, you may have dynamic tests in place. So all that is also giving you good security signals and detective controls. So as you can see, like from the very start, how you start to build on top of it and how it really grows in scope. And what you really need to take there in terms is your decentralized approach. None of this is uh, lean teams work and there's a lot of things in place here. So a decentralized approach where security partnerships come handy for something that's really high scope. There's a ton of activity happening everywhere across the organization in Confluence, in GitHub, on Zoom calls, in in-person meeting rooms. You need all that context. So a dedicated security partner that works with those teams for a quarter or two till the launch really helps. Now, sometimes as a security partner, you may feel pigeonholed because you're just like focused on those set of problems and those set of features, and then you're like, oh, I don't know what's going on otherwise. But this model really works when you really need a focused effort on a certain set of product that's really, really, really critical, that impacts a lot of customers um, all the way until GA. 
Um, then is the security champions, and I'll not go much deeper. Um, I'm, I'm one of those ICs that has been part of the team that did this at Datadog. Chuck gave an excellent presentation about it. But really where the value I found in having our security champions is in them doing the security design review. And it did not just happen overnight. Incremental approach that led it to it, that needed a ton of training that was super tailored to it, uh, and a lot of mentorship as well. But the approach that really helped is learning by doing. So what we did is we ended up creating a worksheet that really helped them ease into it. And the way you do it is, or anyone can do it, is like you pick a service that's of a significant scope, and then you identify all the security controls for it. And once you have done that, you can also, if you have your automated self-service tooling, you can lead people through it to create the threat model. And then finally, once you've identified design vulnerabilities, they should go to the tracking tool, like Jira or whatever, so that it's tracked for implementation later. Uh, an actual view of how this worksheet looks, because I created it and I've let several engineers work with me to have this facilitate the conversation is, yeah, you pick a service, let's talk about application logic, because business logic is the one where the most design flaws reside. So what's the application logic, what it's trying to do? How does your team's SDLC look like, secure SDLC? What's the authentication and authorization security control look like? Access control, safe IO handling, cryptography auditing. Have them write it out for you. Have them start thinking about it from, let them exercise their security chops. You don't go prodding into like, hey, how are you doing this? They come to you with that information and then you start discussing it. And then also data protection and privacy and secrets handling. I feel like this is comprehensive enough where some, if someone has worked through these many controls and come to you beforehand for their service, it's a much smoother conversation because now they have done the pre-work, you have done the pre-work, you get to the action. All that being said, what's really important in terms of sentiments is developer experience. As a software engineer, I really like this one that came from the, the DevEx research, the three core dimensions, the flow state, feedback loops, and cognitive load. And I think Jason Chan wrote a really good article on this, AppSec Through the Lens of uh, DevEx. I liked it, I took inspiration from it, and I'm like, I'm gonna show it to the folks here as well. So what's flow state? Being in the zone, you know, time passes by, and I just love what I do. So it's an immersive work state where the developer is fully focused and involved. How does that map to security? For security activities, how can you make sure that you have flow state. Really streamline the security activities. Have your intakes automated in Slack. Have your intake process smooth out in Jira. Workflows transitioning seamlessly. Effective meeting management, right? Less is more, agendas up front. Have them work through a worksheet. They come prepared, not knowing what to expect. Oh, I'm, I have a meeting with security. I'm not sure what's gonna happen. And an optimized intake process that seamlessly transitions, seamlessly loops in the people when required. Like, oh, I need to loop in privacy. I have an easy plug there. And then async communication, flexibly and responsiveness. Communication is key for everything. Feedback loops, right? Quick responses. It's not like you write a PR and then you wait for days like, oh, is it passing, right? You, if you have CI, it's quick. So build results, code scans, code reviews. Developers love it. So you need to streamline actions. Not everything needs to be blocking. If it's a high fidelity rule and you know you need to block it, sure, go for it. But if it's not a high fidelity rule and you know you don't need to block it, why block it? Transparent communication, clear upfront guidance on like what to expect when you come for a review, what's the outcome going to be. Hey, I'm not gonna block you. So. This is just a way for us to discover what are the security controls that need to be in this place. Why? Because this is critical. Why is it critical? Explain the rationale behind everything. Just don't say it's like this because it's like this. Validate and verify for your findings before. Um, and utilize developer-friendly tools. Leverage issue tracking software. Don't have people jump between different tools. I don't like it, nobody likes it. And then cognitive load. 
yeah, we have a lot of free time at hand, right? Like we have a lot of mental space these days. So mental processing required to complete a task. Keep it minimal. Have as many paved roads, your global base images, your image signing, or like however you can have as many paved roads for your organization, even so more in the trend of platform engineering these days, like if you can have more paved roads added in there, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Auto remediate wherever possible. And it's only possible if you have more paved roads, you know, so you can straight up go to the source and fix things, then have to identify where, where are these different things residing and having to fix it. Security knowledge bases, those are very important. You may say, oh, documentation is outdated these days. But trust me, when I'm in Confluence and I'm searching for something and the security knowledge base pops in, I at least know it's there. I may go read it. And it's just a great way to have awareness. At times, it's also a great way to scale your guidance. If you're doing a security design review, let's say audit logging, are you gonna explain everything? No. It's very easy for people to have um, a reference point. And then also consider the learning curve. If you're asking somebody to do something security-wise and it's not their area of expertise, they are going to have a learning curve and effort. So consider that as well as, as part of cognitive load. Really what is important here is you do not want to end up in a state where the expectations do not match the reality. So key takeaways, again, decentralize your security functions. See what can be delegated, what's gonna work for your organization, what constraints are in place. Build as much security context as possible. Collect as much information you can upfront. Minimize what you don't need. Leverage all your tools, processes, and people effectively. And most important one here is iterative. Nothing's gonna change overnight. Culture takes time to create and build and nurture, so adopt an iterative approach. That's it. Um, I'll open up for the Q&A, and there are some really good references here. The Datadoc Security blog itself is really nice. The Building Secure and Reliable Systems, that's a really nice book because usually you'll see reliability and security both important but tough for each other, and sometimes when you build for reliability, you may have to compromise for security and the OWASP top 10 because we are in OWASP conference. Um, and this article is really good too by Jason Chan. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Right, yeah. So the question, I'll repeat the question. What are your views on not failing a build or failing a build in a certain context? So when you say failing a build. Promoting to a higher environment. Exactly, promoting to a higher environment. If you have enough checks already in place that gives you enough confidence that just because a, a certain set of finding has been found, you don't need to block it because you have other detective controls in place. It's again going back to like what's important for your organization. Um, do you need to ship fast? And if it's not gonna have the impact, that's gonna impact like certain set of customers or you can deal with it, sure, promote it. But it's very contextual in my opinion. Um, and that is why when you're writing rules that run in CI, you need to do a lot of iterative approach of trying a set of rules, communicating about them upfront, and then having scores associated with it so that you can promote a rule or demote a rule based on the noise it is generating and the value it is creating. So um, you don't just roll out a rule and then have, you know, have it blocked, it needs to be rolled out to either a staging environment or if you're doing, there needs to be enough comms as well about it. So that's, that's what I think, that the, the topic of blocking and non-blocking in CI 
is very contentious. You really need a lot of groundwork for it, a lot of communication, you fine tuning your rules. I think that's where I think security team spends up a lot of its cycles, really figuring out is, it, is this really high fidelity enough? But again, the context matters. If you are in operating in an environment where you really need to block it because you think the impact is that big, you, you do need to block it then. Well, thanks everyone. It was really nice to have you here and thanks OWASP for this opportunity.